guys. Hi, we're here with Laura from Megalith Hunter. She's got a fairly new uh, YouTube channel, but it's amazing. It's super awesome. It's all about um, the megaliths and particularly in Malta at this point. And that's where she's living. And it's like, they're super consumable. They're usually about under 15 minutes and she uses tons of pictures and she explains everything well. And if you care about megalith at like one like you have to subscribe to her channel it's amazing so welcome aboard Laura hi thank you Nikki thanks for having me on tonight well today for you <laughs> yeah yeah okay so so you are actually living in Malta right yes that's right okay cool so what what got you into being the megalith hunter like how like what's your story here how did you <laughs> well I mean I've loved ancient history since you know, most of my life, I've always read lots of books on it. Um, my parents always had lots of books on ancient history on their shelves. And, but it was always just, um, just something I would read about. I love going, um, traveling and visiting lots of archaeological sites. And I'm also interested in lots of other periods of history. You know, I, I like um, the Renaissance. I like learning a little bit about Georgian England and, and going to stately homes and all these types of things. But then last year, I obviously was stuck a bit in Malta because of everything. And I decided to book a bunch of staycations on the island of Gozo. I love Gozo. I go usually at least once a year, but I, it was the only option really last year. And I just thought, right, what am I gonna do? Um, I have got no sites left to see. I've been to everything in Malta so many times. And then I realized that there are there are so many more sites than the ones that have been turned into museums or that the ones that are really well referenced in literature. There are so many scattered megaliths related to that period in history, the Neolithic, and they're a little bit tricky to find. So I thought this is actually quite a challenge. So I started off doing it in Gozo, just anytime I, I was um, there on holiday for a few days with my family, I would look for old, um, maps and references to, to megaliths and then go looking for them and I would be falling over and getting my legs scratched on thorns and, and climbing all over the place um, and sometimes I could go a whole you know morning or afternoon looking for a dolmen and not find it it was very frustrating and that's when I decided to kind of record what I was doing and call myself the megalith hunter because I felt like I was really hunting these megaliths and, and it was really hard to find them they were, they were hiding from me. Um, and then I just sort of turned it into a thing. I, I kept doing it in Gozo and then more and more time I spent on it in Malta on the mainland, um, not looking for scattered megaliths that may have once belonged to temples or temple-like structures, looking for dolmens, looking for menhirs, anything that I can find references to in old literature. And, um, and then the more that I did it, I just started to I got a lot of people on Instagram asking me questions and participating in my polls and quizzes. And I've always been interested in the more mysterious side of history because I think there is a really big mystery to it. So I, um, so then I started to make videos to explain it in more detail. And I also wanted to be really um, careful to, to include academic references because um, there's lots of like throwaway comments that people make. And I wanted to be much more thorough than that. I wanted to go through all of the academic papers um, that, that I can get access to and books that I've, I've have and buy some more books and just make sure that everything I talk about is as comprehensive, comprehensive as it possibly can be. And also, like you say, consumable because you don't want to have um, massively long videos. I wanted people to just understand it all in like a short, a short 15, 20 minutes and to just research 15, 20 minutes takes a really long time you have to go through so many books to get all those references um and yeah so now i just kind of i've turned it into a thing and it's it's taking up a lot of time and i really enjoy it but i i now have the intention to go international with it because i do know a lot about megaliths overseas as well it's just that i can't go and photograph them or do videos on them so i don't talk too much about them at this point um i do in the videos a little bit but my instagram feed is purely mulcher at the moment so once it's easier to travel again i will expand on it Perfect. Well, I mean, I, I do think you are, I, I mean, Malta is a very important location. Like pr prior to Gobekli Tepe being found, like it was, it had the oldest megaliths that we knew of. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean so, and I, I heard you mention in one of your videos that 
it so is there there's an older there's older sites than the hypogeum the hypogeum dates back to 3300 bc so it's about three or four hundred years later than some of the temple structures okay all right so that well i mean the, i think they found some um they found some evidence that it was being used earlier than that even but um but it was really it was used primarily from 3300 bc onwards um and that's and then over the next thousand years it was really expanded and this sort of megalithic features were carved out that match the temples overground so do you think that it's like one of those things where it's made like megalith megaliths in general are um more preserved on some place like malta because it is an island and thereby protected by just just consequence of what it is like less you would have less invaders like making their way to get there to destroy things or or do you think there was something special about this particular land I mean, I'm not sure. I think, I think a lot of the megaliths were were buried in soil, and they were on um, farmland, and and it just it ended up protecting them, really. Um, there have been so many different invasions of Malta, and lots of different uh, cultures have taken over Malta over the years, and they just seem to have remained hidden under uh, soil cover. So that's actually really lucky, and also subsequent use. Um, obliterated some earlier sites, but then at the same time preserved parts of them. So Tarshien, which is an extremely, um, I mean, it's a fantastic complex. It's got four, four temples, but only three are really, you have quite a lot remaining. And that was used in the Bronze Age as well as a, as a cemetery. So it kind, of, um, it kind of preserved it in a way. So when they started excavating it and they removed that layer, they found all these megaliths underneath. So that was quite convenient. Um, and then similar thing ha happened, well, Tas Silge was reused in Punic times. It was reused in Roman times and as a Byzantine church. And actually the original archeologists that were excavating the site didn't think there was a megalithic temple there. But once they got digging down, they realized that parts of it had been used for the later remodeling. So either megaliths being buried into soil or being reused by later cultures um, has helped to preserve some of them. Um, but I still think, yeah, I mean, of course, I think it's a special place. I, I can't quite get my head around why there are so many megaliths. Yeah, yeah. There, and there's, <laughs> there's such a high concentration so close to each other compared to anywhere else, really, that I can think of. I mean, I mean, maybe Sardinia, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's really for me, I just think it's really bizarre that on the, such a small island, you have so many of these very major little like uh, megalithic sites. Uh, they're, they're quite major monuments, really, if you think about it. I mean, you think what sort of populations sustain that? Why, why would they need that many places of worship um, if, it, if they were ritual sites? And I mean, I've, I've started putting this whole chart kind of thing together, like a map. And so I, a lot of the temples are in clusters. So you'll go into one part of the island and there'll be like three temples together. Then 500 meters, two kilometers away, there'll be another bunch of temples. And, and then that seems to kind of make one cluster. And then you have another cluster elsewhere. And people are always looking for patterns. This, this is, it's great, but it's also a tiny bit frustrating because people spend a lot of time looking for patterns that cannot exist if you don't have the full picture. And you can't look for patterns between all these monuments unless you know how many there were originally, what stage they were built, because they were not all built at exactly the same time. And then you can sort of understand the relationship to each other. So what I'm trying to do at the minute is put together this whole thing, which um, talks about all the sites that have been destroyed and the GPS locations of them, all the ones that are still extant, the, all the scattered megaliths, the ones I found and the ones that I have yet to find, all the ones that you cannot go to because they're on private property, but they're well referenced in the literature so you know they exist. 
and then sort of map them all out and the years that they were all present. And then you can start to build a picture of what it looked like at the, at the initial phase of megalith building and what it looked like like a few hundred years later and then towards the end of that period. Um, and just doing, like I was working on it today and it's amazing, like I've already got so many sites and I'm, and I'm only including, well, I'm, I'm kind of um, grading it. So I'm giving prominence to sites that were mentioned mainly by archeologists in like the early 20th century and that they're in quite a few papers and books and then a little bit less importance to ones that have only been mentioned by one person for example and they're not really sure if it was megalithic and now it's gone and they just don't know so but even then i mean you just we're talking a massive intensity of monuments that must have supported a, a population that lived they didn't live in the temples um the archaeologists know that so they must have lived in domestic villages and there's only a few domestic villages been found because they built out of mud brick they didn't build out of um well obviously megalithic buildings within their within their villages so there's not much left and it's it's really hard to find the evidence for it so where this population actually lived no one really knows so i find one of the one of the, there's a lot of interesting elements about this mm -hmm. uh, these interesting but the cart ruts um that you talk about and mm -hmm. how common they are on uh Malta and I find like so 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 with these do these kind of lead or is this like a road system that you're finding that leads to other other megalithic sites or is it more just like they'll just be a randomized patch of a one little cart rut well they all seem to they it's very possible they all were linked together as a network it, it looks that way. Um, and most archaeologists think that. I mean, there are hundreds, there could be more than hundreds, like thousands, I'm not even sure. Um, and sometimes when development work is taking place, um, they find them. So, I mean, they're finding them. I, I remember going into this one village many years ago and looking at the cart ruts that were on a map that people talked about, but it's not one of the most popular sites to go to. And then I just happened to be going there to photograph them recently. And I realized there was much, um, much better intact ones in the field next door. I mean, incredibly defined, deep carvings. And it turned out that when um, they were putting up a build, starting to dig foundations to put a building up, they found a whole new network of them, which was probably linked to the other ones. You know but what you see these are? are? What, like, what is, what, what kind of... What kind of rock is that? Are they? Ready? It's limestone. It's okay. limestone. Yeah. So, um, so that's this. This island is um, made of like three kinds of limestone. So that that was a really interesting. They just keep turning up everywhere, and I. But they're not. They don't lead to megaliths, really, or temples. So. Um, the experts think they're probably from the later Bronze Age, but they don't know. I mean, there's no way of dating them. I think there's something really strange about that, that whole Kara thing. And they do, they do have them in other countries, um, just not as many of them. And not like there's so many. I mean, I've been marking them all on a map and sometimes I put it on my Instagram stories and I add to it. I try to just include ones I've actually visited. Um, and already there's so, we're talking loads and loads of them and they're all over both islands, both of the really largest islands. You had a really good islands. point about them though. You had a really good point where you were saying like, if they were just made naturally by wear and tear by going on them, then there should be some sort of path where the animals hooves would have walked as well. Not just where the, so what they are is they're, they're just perfectly, um, uh, spaced for the actual wheels of like a, a what do you call it like a wagon or whatever mm. um and they're pretty deep yeah they are and that they've got i mean i've read a lot of books on this and um i won't go into too much detail in this video but basically what the experts are saying is if they were worn out why are there no um markings from animals or or even humans drag dragging like a sled you know like right. foot footprints if they um were for wheels, why, uh, in some of them, there's quite a sudden drop, which looks really impractical. Um, and, and there's just so, the, basically what they're, and then there was also the idea of them being used for irrigation. And that's also, a lot of experts now have said that that doesn't seem likely. So basically what they're saying, the experts are saying is that all of the varied characteristics of the cart ruts um, there is no one theory that can explain all of them. 
So you could say like this set of carts could have been transport, but then you go to another set and, they, and then the, it doesn't make sense. And then this set across the field looks like kind of furrows. Okay, it could have been used for irrigation. There could have been a soil cover there, but then they go to another section and that doesn't make sense either. And some of them go up hills, some of them curve. It's really well, and then um, some of the pictures strange. I've seen of them, they seem very like like very sharp, do, like you know, like it's a, almost a very intentional cut in a way. Oh, it look it really looks that way. I mean, when you stand in them, especially when um some of like when you see ones that have just been found during construction work that have been in the soil probably for the thousands of years since they were created, oh, they're very pristine and deeply carved. Like it's it's like really mind blowing when you see it. And then when you see super worn ones, it, it, obviously it's not as easy to make out. Right. I love this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I, I don't know if you've gotten into the nubs, like, you know how that there's, uh -huh. the it's like, it's like, this is going to be my new like nub thing. I'm going to be like always looking for cart ruts. I, I, I feel like I've seen some in Mexico and in India. Um, like when I was at uh, Maha Bali Puram, uh, there was there was definitely some uh, some weird markings in stone that like and people had suggested it was it was cart ruts and I was like okay but like that's a really weird line to have up here like why would you have carts up here like it, we were like almost on like a, a like a rock hill and there were you know this the lines and I was thinking it was a weird place for a road but um okay so that's an amazing mystery I love that I mean, maybe it was like their own like train system or something, who knows, some sort of thing they had going, but, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the, okay. The, the figurines that they find in Malta, the little fat uh -huh. ladies or whatever. Um, when I was in art history, like when I was back in college, I always thought this was, I, I for at the time I was just like they don't know that that's the dumbest thing ever because they would say these are fertility fertility statues <laughs> and I was just kind of thinking to myself like so what do you mean by that and you know my my professor was like oh they would have used them in ritual or worship for fertility to get pregnant and I'm like okay there's kind of a lot of them and so are you saying that they just would put them next to their bed and be like oh if this is by my bed I'll get pregnant like I don't I don't know I have a hard time knowing why they just revert to that and we, they could have been painted they could have had who know I mean I don't know what do you think about them uh, I've never really believed the fertility thing um I don't know I just uh, they date back the ones here obviously are the temple date back to the temple period but the sort of and the nickname the fat lady statues but the the ones in the paleolithic you find in Austria and France and Germany. I mean, they are 25,000 years old. So whatever they meant, <laughs> I mean, it must've been important. And I, and I think that there's a very strong likelihood there was um, a connection somehow between whatever it meant to the Paleolithic and whatever it meant to the Neolithic, it meant the same thing. Um, but the fertility thing, okay. So I read something once that said, oh, because, um, in those times, they probably mistakenly thought that if you were corpulent and bigger breasted, you were more fertile. And therefore, when they were worried about fertility, they then worshipped deities that had this shape. It all just seems a bit strange to me. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of assuming and a lot of assumptions. And it, but I also find it's the same thing with the cycladic uh, figurines, like, you know, the little mm. ones, the little naked ladies who are like, kind of look like Easter Island things. Um, they always say those are fertility statues. And I'm kind of going like, is it just because it's a statue that has breast? Because 50% of the world has breast. Like I, it's, it's kind of an interesting that just that it's a female figurine, it therefore equals uh, fertility yeah. it's kind of bizarre to me but yeah uh, those little fat ladies I feel bad calling them that but they kind of are and they're, I know uh, but that is kind of what they're actually referred to here that is the what literature. they're called so it's it's really hard to say anything else but, yeah they um, they are a fascinating mystery and are they only found in graves or are they kind of found separately do you know no no these are in the temple sites as well as the um hypogea I don't think they've been found in the simple rock cut tombs. Um, 
only in sites that were, seemed to be much more ritualistic um, in terms of their use. And the ones in the, the one, so in the hypogeum of House Afliani, one was found famously called the sleeping lady because she's lying on her side and she's asleep. And they're like, um, say, oh, maybe it was a, a kind of priestess in a trance-like state or something like that. But yeah, once again, no one knows. And I, I don't know, I, I actually, I kind of, I've read quite a few things about that. And I talked a little bit in my video on that. Maybe it was some sort of initiation or incubation thing. Cause I've, I read that, that those sort of um, rituals took place in later classical antiquity. So they could have had a precedent in the stone age, maybe. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure, but there's more to it than fertility, I think. Well, yeah, there's, I mean, I mean, and this, these could have been their, their deities or whatever, you know, who knows? Yeah. But, it's, but I still don't know why their deities had to be so big. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that, that is interesting. But I mean, it's like, we, it's always, we always look at everything from our current lens versus like the lens back then, but you know, uh, prior to, I, I mean, in the 1900s, it was, and even a lot of, it used to be like very desired to be voluptuous. You know, this whole like mm. Natalie Portman straight boy look thing is new. Like that's not always. Yeah, I know that. But but even if it was, um, even if it was an ideal of beauty in those in those times. It's um, still pretty heavy. It was, it's still, I mean, we're talking like, this is the Neolithic. It was, they'd only just got settled agriculture. I mean, you can't imagine food was just so easy to come by. Yeah. And it was probably seen as a wealth symbol as well to have to have um a size on because you know a lot of people would would have struggled i guess um you know you just needed one bad drought to to get rid of your crops um and it's a small island so it, i mean i think it's very possible that it was seen as partly you know an ideal of beauty in those days and that was linked with wealth and riches and the fact that it meant that you were well sustained um but then you know then you think okay so if that was seen in that way then maybe that was um the leaders were kind of like um those were statues of the leaders of the of yeah. the group the elites or maybe they were deities but there's a lot of statues i mean <laughs> so many statues and they're all different like you have really small ones you have like medium-sized ones then you have like these giant ones that are like um broken now but would have been i don't know like eight nine ten foot tall okay so let's 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 talk a little bit real quick about the job like what's your what's your feeling about um you know there are some giant um what do you call those uh trial trial uh like Stonehenge or, or Trilithon or where it's like they think they're entryways but they're not entryways kind of thing there's uh -huh. some, there's some like little bit of giant reference things on Malta so uh so what what's your feelings about all that living there I don't know I think the giant thing um it was first referenced in myths and legends in more recent times you know like in the 1800s um and okay so you've got these giant statues and obviously giant megaliths and I can understand that in the 1800s it was hard to explain how they got there without saying like a giant bought them so that's how it got into um legend but then um the some of the portals and entrances within the temples are just so tiny like I just don't get it I'm like struggling to fit through them <laughs> well and the, yeah yeah and you also have a lot of those um the weird like oracle kind of whole things which i if they were windows or i don't know what they were but uh -huh. those those are kind of very if they'd be a small window like i, I don't know oh gosh yeah they would be very very small i mean they could, i don't think they could have been windows um but even i was looking at them the other day and i was thinking i mean people the, the popular idea of it being called an oracle hole is that um there was like a priestess sat inside the apse and she was uttering like, um, you know, oracles <laughs> to an audience outside, just like the Oracle of Delphi in later classical antiquity. And so you have this audience outside just waiting to listen to, to her. But I mean, I don't know. I feel like there are better ways they could have done it. 
and they seemed pretty good at everything. So, and then um, I thought maybe that it was for passing an offering, but they're so small. What could you, you could barely fit your hand in them. Well, you know, with, with all these megalithic sites, I kind of feel like, like these are the bones of something. Like I feel like there would have been other building materials used in conjunction with everything that was going on that, I, or at least I don't, I mean, I saw, I, I assume, I don't know, because uh, like, you know, wood, like, like half us, like most of our, our buildings that we build, I, they're not going to be here five, like they're not going to be here 3,600. I mean, they're not going to be here that many years from now. Like uh -huh. we have, we're, everything kind of like deteriorates and, you know, um, so I, I think that uh, we're, we're just seeing the skeletal remains of what something would have been. So when we come up with these things like, oh, that's, that, that's like where, that's where they would speak or, you know, like that's the confessional, I'm kind of going like, eh, okay, maybe, or maybe there was just like, they, they had a log stuffed in that and there was a big beam here and who knows, I don't really know, but. Exactly. I mean, and that's kind of the explanation for various other holes in the temples. The, the ones on the side of each entrance are thought to be a Neolithic type of hinge. And then a rope would be tied through because they're like a little tunnel. So you'd have a rope through it and a rope on the other side, and then it would be tied to something. So the ropes have decomposed, whatever, whatever it was tied to is decomposed. Okay, fine. That makes sense. So we've decided those holes were like to do with Functionals. structure, but then we've decided this one was a confessional. Like why? I don't know. <laughs> well, the other, the other thing is like they're, um, they look like decorative to me, but those little, the little tiny dents, the little tiny dent holes everywhere, um, which that also kind of just makes my previous theory that I just said sound like crap, because those do look like those are meant to be seen. Like those look mm. like they're on the outside of the stone and they're meant to be seen. So there wouldn't have been any kind of other structural thing, presumably that would cover those up because they're like a decorative motif. So, or at least, I don't know, like, what do you think about all those dents, the little Hold oh, the pitted decoration. I mean, yeah, they just look like they look like decoration. Yeah. Um, don't know whether it was symbolic. There's quite a few different kinds of decoration on the temples. Some the spirals, and there's like forked spirals. Um, some have animal carvings on them, um, and then the pitted decoration is very popular. So, like it, I don't, but then again, there are some temples where there are, there's no decoration at all, and I always think. Um, is it because it was kind of cleared out of decoration, the decorative elements before it, when it when they were no longer using it? Did it fall into disrepair? Like we have buildings that go derelict these days. Um, or did that temple have a different kind of use or purpose? Or um, did each community kind of have some responsibility in how they decorated their, their clusters of temples? I don't know. The, these, because I find it really strange. Sometimes you just walk into like Ta Hajrat, which has like no decoration at all, no altars. They found very few finds as well. Uh, it could also be that um, even though it looked like it had been buried for a long time, maybe in the past, it had been over the thousands of years, it's been kind of, yeah, looted or something. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know about the pitted decoration, but there's another, there is um, the, another strange kind of altar, because these things are called altars, referred to as altars anyway, um, in Nidra, which has an orthostat on either side of it. And these have drilled holes, but they're not the same as the pitted decoration, because the pitted decoration is like even dense throughout. Right. These are drilled holes that are all different uh, lengths. They look like a counting system as if um, whoever was drilling them stopped at some point in the middle of counting it. And um, some theories have been put forward that they were actually to do with astronomy, counting the days between the appearance of certain stars. Um, none of it's proven, um, but yeah, that's kind of like one of the popular theories for it. Um, definitely not just for decoration, that one. But I find that altar really weird as well. And no one can seem to explain it to me. And I keep like looking it up in books. It's a really strange altar because you walk in and there's paving slabs on the floor. There's, there's like little stairs going into it. Um, and there's paving slabs on the floor with holes in, which are called libation holes, which may have been for pouring liquid offerings or they may have been for something else. Um, and then when you get to the altar, you've got two uprights on either side, and then you've got three 
um, slabs at the front, which are about half my height, and then like a little pen behind. And you, you'd struggle to get into it to climb over the slabs. There's no like entrance or doorway. Um, so, and then the drilled holes are on the inside of that. But I, I, it baffles me how they got in and out of it. Was there once some stairs and you came in from a roof or, I mean, no one seems to mention this anywhere. And I just stand there, like I was there the other day, just thinking, I, co I don't get it. Okay, and every time which I go, which one go is that there, one? Think, because they all in, um, have the one. Which one? That's um, Nidra. So this is near, you've got a cluster, a UNESCO World Heritage Site called Hajraim and Amnidra. And Amnidra is like 500 meters uh, southwest of Hajraim, and it's made up of three temples, the upper temple, the middle temple, and the lower temple. The upper temple has three apses. It's the simplest one. And this is where you have this, like in the middle apse. And I just like, I was there the other day, and I, I like going there and just staring for ages, trying to figure it all out, just thinking maybe I'll be hit with some kind of inspiration today, and right. I'll, I'll have an explanation. <laughs> Or I'll see something I haven't, I always see something I haven't seen before. Um, but yeah, I, I can't explain that. It's such a weird one. Uh, that is interesting. Um, what do you think of the, the, for me, when the first time I ever started looking into the Malta um, megaliths, I like the spirals reminded me so much of the Neolithic stuff in Ireland. I was like, whoa, these are mm -hmm. like the same culture or something like something's going on. Like what's, what is this? Um, so where are all those spirals located? Um, you have them at, at Hajraim. Um, you have them at Tarshian, lots of them at Tarshian. Um, I don't think there's anything left. Well, it's hard to tell because sometimes if there was um, just a few small blocks with decoration on in, in some of the less intact temples, the blocks get taken to the museum. And they're on display there, but I'm just thinking about it. And I think most of the ones on display are from the um, are from Hajraim, Niger, and uh, Tarshien, and Gigantir, I think, as well. Yeah. Well, I I do know that limestone is does corrode with rainwater. Like uh, I I recently went on this like I was digging for like these dinosaur tracks and. And, oh how cool <laughs> yeah it was really cool I I um I, I'm a I'm a I'm a big dork like I belong to the gym and mineral club is like I go with like some fossil people a lot and there's, <laughs> a, there's a site like an hour and a half south of me and there's this um it's called the Glen Rose and there's this river that has um a bunch of dinosaur tracks like three different kinds of dinosaur tracks and like the big giant um well anyway but there's the one we were looking at where like it was a, it they were related to t-rexes so they had the three like the the big three uh, uh -huh. toes or whatever and the guy the one of the geologists I was with he was 90 and he's like when I was 30 I uncovered this one and he showed us that and he was saying like he was saying when we first uncovered it like removed the dirt from it and everything uh he was like it was so sharply defined he's like and then just he's like it's just so sad to see it now 50 years later just being you know having uh floods from the river having um rain just being exposed to all the elements it it's still you can tell it's a dinosaur print but it's 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 fading it's like it's not that it was impressive but it wasn't like didn't look like that fresh you know it looked like it had been a uh, exposed for millions of years or something. And it, I didn't, and I, for me, didn't realize that, oh, once you expose a lot of these things, especially with limestone, um, they, they, they won't be around forever. Like this track being left on the riverbank like that. Um, I bet you it has maybe a hundred more years before it's gone with the wind. So that, yeah. that was something I didn't even, I didn't, I didn't actually realize that. So I think that's really important that they are doing stuff. Like some people complain about Gobekli Tepe, how they covered it, but I'm like, mm, no, it's like the elements, like it's been buried this entire time, you know, like the elements will take things and will, de you know. De uh -huh, exactly. I know they, they do have covers here on um, Hajraim, um, Niger and Tarshin, Tarshin at the moment. And they also have like environmental monitoring to keep an eye on it, obviously, to see if there's any effects on it. And even the hypergeum, you you have to go on an organized tour. There's only a few people allowed in at any one time. 
and they often close it for a period of months to to check what's happening what's happened with um, deterioration to see if anything needs to be done to stop further deterioration because obviously you'd rather protect it for future generations because these things have only been dug up since um, since late 1800s and early 1900s and if you look at Hajar-Im on the south side of it which is um, sea facing the megaliths are so much more damaged than on the other side because of the sea air and the wind because the weather can be pretty bad in the winter with cyclones and stuff so wow that, yeah that's pre that's pretty crazy but um yeah okay so real quick can you kind of like walk i know the difference between this but i feel like you're a really good explainer at stuff and i i have a lot of people who don't know the difference between a dolomite and a manier and a carn and you know like um can you give us kind of like just the little basic definitions of what those are when people are talking about that um yeah i mean dolomans that's um they're everywhere in the world and it's just two massive upright stones with a horizontal capstone sitting on top sometimes there's more than two uprights and sometimes they make a whole passage like with the Hunna Baden in the Netherlands and with various other kind of passage tombs that you get in Ireland and, and Scotland and whatever. And then you have cairns are like lots of smaller stones. I guess that's the best way of describing it. There's often like a megalithic passageway that the or like tomb section, um, then covered with lots and lots of small stones. And, and the thing with dolmens and cairns passage tombs they tend to also be covered with a big mound as well in a lot of cases which doesn't always survive over time um and then temples i mean <laughs> the temples in malta are pretty okay. unique they're just like these absidal buildings that um it's thought were for ritual purposes which is why they're referred to as temples and they're an apse is like a semicircular room and they're, they're nearly all like that. There are some destroyed sites, um, sites that no longer exist, but were recorded in the early 1900s. And they had rectangular structures and no one knows if they were really temple, temples or some other building, but they were definitely Neolithic. Um, and then- The Meniers. Men, men here is just men here. a stone on its own. Now, um, in Malta, the, there were a few and they, it, they could have belonged to, to a, a temple once. I mean, it, maybe the whole area just got destroyed through urban development or farming. No one really knows. Um, or they could have been isolated men here because those do exist in other countries. All over the UK, obviously, there's thousands of stone circles, which is lots of individual men here is made into circles. There are stone rows, stone avenues, all different structures. And then every now and then there's just a singular men here, um, which, you know, no one knows what it's for. Boundary marker, maybe something to do with astronomy. Um, yeah, those always trip Something me ritualistic, like... stone worshipping, I don't know. Yeah. So, and even in Malta, okay, so we talk about the men here is that there are just, I think there's, there are four and then there's a few, no, four, is it four? One, two, three, yeah, four. And then there's a few random um, blocks, not as tall and not as elaborate looking, but which it's thought are, purposefully put that were purposely put that were probably part of a building and some have been incorporated into rubble walls now um over the years so you'll be walking along and you'll see a nice modern rubble wall and then you're just this megalith in the middle of it that's just been kind of included um so yeah no one really knows what they're for and there could have been stone circles here originally i mean the shara stone circle which is the hypogeum mingozo it originally was marked out by a stone circle overground. It had had megaliths all around, apparently, but they've kind of they haven't stood the test of time. And then also in Gozo, there is another kind of half stone circle, which I have put on Instagram and on my website. And it's. Um, it might have been a circle, it might have been part of an apse of a temple. But, you know, there is a possibility that that was a stone circle. And if it was a stone circle, um, maybe it marked out a hypogeum and maybe there's a hypogeum under there. Like, but there's a lot of these sites have not been excavated because they're on private property and 
and also I mean I guess I, from what I've read archaeologists um, in general do like to protect certain sites for future generations you cannot excavate everything in one lifetime first you don't have the budget second of all often access is difficult and third of all it's not really fair on the future generations just because um, in this kind of um, in this past like 50 years we've got really good at this stuff it doesn't mean we should dig everything up yeah it's true I mean and we might be better at it in the future I mean just like just like any I used to work in restoration stuff and and I oftentimes was restoring previous restoration attempts um, because of the glue that they used or a um, you know like a certain chemical that they use that like turned the whole vase or the painting or whatever like like a dark brown you know like we sometimes we don't know what we do how it will age and you know that uh -huh. kind of thing so I, I definitely think that um yeah I, I definitely you know because like they say that with Egypt like there's so much stuff underneath the Giza plateau and there's so many sites that we've never really touched and it's like why don't we get in there why don't we and I'm like yeah well what do we do with stuff we we seem to discombobulate it like we take it away from its source we put it here we put it there we expose it to elements like what we just talked about with like the other things happening yeah we have to also give other people some you know time to have some cool stuff to look at too because at one point all the stuff that we dig if we dug up will go with the wind uh -huh, totally um and i kind of i think that future researchers you know they might actually get to the bottom of it so <laughs> I'm hoping that I do but you never know <laughs> well I think this this is this is why this is so important because it's like you're a, you know your uh, boots on the ground like doing stuff going around seeing and exposing people to think of you never know who you're going to inspire who's like oh I actually just made this connection and then like you know we build we like I basically think not one of us is an island with this puzzle i think we can all kind of figure out like little elements more and more of it and the more we expose the new little things that like like for me you are the first time i've really heard someone go into cart ruts and i'm like whoa that's amazing and it's so true because i've seen a cart rut and kind of wondered about it so like it, it just we're all adding to the puzzle so i think that's really important and i love what you're doing there Oh, thank you. No, I, and I love talking to people because it gets you thinking because everybody's backgrounds are different, you know. Um, so, so if I'm talking to someone that actually is an engineer or is in construction, they give you some new insight into into the to the way the megaliths could have been built. And then also family, like my family will just sit, we'll just sit there having dinner and they'll say, oh, we we're looking at one of your videos in the day. And we noticed that there's this marking on the facade of one of the temples. Did you notice it? I'm like, no, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> let me check. And then I go into the source, see what I can find, if there's any information on it. And then, you know, just opens up a whole new <laughs> kind of can of worms. But yeah, uh, and I love that because it gets everybody talking about the mystery and contributing so, so what is for for um so what do you think about the whole um young Adrias? do you think there was a big flood like do, where do you think these people went like do you like what do you think happened to everything like what do you think about that oh i mean i do think um so a recent archaeological excavation done in Malta called the Fraxis project between 2013 2018 so they have published a couple of monographs um, and they look at environmental degradation at the end of the temple period so that could have been one of the reasons why those those people left I do think they may have popped up somewhere else you can't avoid the connections between certain sites I mean Menorca for example they look really very much like Malta and they are not from the same time period they're like um I think they're bronze age so you know could could it it could be that when the temple period left people left here and they did leave before the bronze age culture came in so the temple people definitely left and there was a gap between the two cultures um maybe they did go somewhere like that and start building similar things I don't know um but going back to the whole catastrophe I mean the earliest um, evidence of settlement in Malta is around um, 8,000 years ago. And this is just early Neolithic farming. This is not the megalith builders. Then, so they were, they were farming for some time, and then it appears um, 
according to the archaeologists, that they just left. And then for nearly 1,000 years, the island was empty. There's a big gap in the archaeological record called the uh, fifth millennium hiatus. Um, it, or it could be that the population was so reduced that there's very little evidence um, been found of their farming activity. And then the megalith builders um, came around, firstly building simple rock cut tombs, then they started this whole megalith, uh, megalith sort of enterprise. And they often reuse sites of the predecessors. But since those people had been there, I don't know, like almost a thousand years before and had only built mud huts and stuff, why would they necessarily go to those same places? So it could be the same culture came back or something like that. So no one really knows about like, but they just know that there's a gap in the archeological record. Um, and those early Neolithic farmers, the ones like the very original settlers came from Sicily. The megalith builders, we don't know. We know that the early um, Neolithic farmers came from Sicily because of a similarity between their pottery and pottery that's found in, in Sicily. But the megalith builders just sort of appeared here and they did trade, it seems, because they were using obsidian and um, obsidian tools, which is from other islands around the Mediterranean, like Pantelleria and Lipari. Um, but so they came by sea, but we don't know kind of why or why they were obsessed with building megaliths or where they got those skills from. Now, I do like the idea of a lost civilization theory. I've read all of Graham Hancock's books. I mean, ever since like the, the 90s, um, I, was, I was reading and absolutely enthralled with, with many different theories to do with lost civilizations or, or something about our past being a little bit more mysterious than what we give it credit for. Um, but I still think that you, we're missing like, we're still missing obviously the evidence to support that completely. We have, we can see there's something going on, but you know, you don't have the exact proof. Um, and I think, because I always say this, like, so let's say during the last ice age, before, before the, so during the last glacial maximum, when the sea levels were a lot lower, um, let's say there was some sort of a- Land bridge or something. Yeah, like there were, there were land bridges for sure um, all over. Um, northern Europe and um, between Sicily and Malta. Um, Malta at that time just had lots of like hippopotami and uh, elephants and giant swans and things and it was a much wetter environment for some reason during that period it wasn't um, it wasn't inhabited um, and neither was Sicily but Northern Europe was obviously we know that but they were hunter-gatherers then come the end of the last ice age, all of us, and then obviously the catastrophe of the Younger Dryas period, which does look like it was a catastrophe that caused it. Straight after that, we get early agriculture. And then we get a few thousand years later, this obsession with megaliths. Well, not a few thousand years later, of course, Gobekli Tepe is one of the earliest oh, ones. Right. But I mean, we only know that one from kind of the, what was the Mesolithic in the West and, and that. And then, and then you start to get the, the megaliths becoming like a, a really big feature of Europe during the Neolithic period. So it's like, but like why? Why would that catastrophe all of a sudden spark this kind of sort of uh, sophistication, this kind of settling of hunter-gatherers into domestic settlements, into an agricultural way of life, and then into megalith building? Of course, it does look like it didn't just come up from nowhere and they got the ideas from somewhere before. But if there was a more sophisticated civilization that existed during the last ice age and it existed alongside the hunter gatherers, where is the evidence for it now? Because it could be under the sea or there's something that we're missing. When we look at the evidence, we're just not seeing it. Well, also, I mean, I do think dating stone is very hard and it's very flawed. I mean, because the stone itself has been around since the creation of who knows what, you know, like. Um, uh, but I don't think the stone is often the, the dating that's used. It's the sort yeah. of, um, it's the, it's whatever can be dated within the soils around the stone. Right. But that's what I'm saying is like, we, we might be dating the things wrong. Like there might be things that are older than we think they are like staring us in the, in, in the, in our face, mm -hmm. but you know, you can't prove that because you have to, we, we don't even, you know, we're using, we're using things that could have come after that was already there. Uh-huh. Exactly. Or maybe, I mean, if the, if we, if we are talking about catastrophe and I was saying this in my most recent video, 
of course there's been catastrophes there's catastrophes all the time i mean natural disasters happen all the time and and they're in the geological record and they're in historic records and i just don't understand why we why we can't accept that that could definitely have happened in the past and if it happened and it maybe happened repeatedly um some evidence just won't survive it and maybe the only thing that will survive it is is a giant rock <laughs> like yeah but then whatever's around it kind of can get swept away like um like your pollens and your grains and your uh, anything that's that's yeah. buried in the soil even your your metals corrode and your your you know like your your metals and your your woods uh, all that it's it all will um unless just the very right conditions uh, that it's buried in they'll corrode and they'll go away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think there is like i'm really drawn to the idea of a lost civilization or because i just find it i mean it's not like these things sprung suddenly i mean it wasn't quite so sudden but but they certainly don't seem to have much of a precedent so um yeah like and the, and it definitely is, does all seem to coincide with the end of the last ice age so yeah it does i mean this the, i mean the, the, those theories are all coming together you know pretty nicely i just i get a little frustrated that we don't have a continual line of um i i, I don't know i just it just feels like I mean, we guess we kind of do. We like know there's some cultures existing everywhere in history, but I, I like that just bothers me that they were there and then they're gone for a thousand years and then another <laughs> culture comes. Like that happens everywhere. There's like there that happens like in uh, with the Native Americans over here. Like there's Chaco Canyon was in and inhabited from 800 to 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 1200, and then and it's like this giant you know, like nine story buildings, like these giant kivas and, and big pueblos that are built. And then they're just abandoned before, before the Spanish conquistadors even came before anything. And you're kind of going like, why would you abandon your New York city? I mean, it's like that. And then, uh -huh. but just no, there's no explanation, you know, and you're kind of going, what? <laughs> Interesting. No, but they talk about here it being like environmental degradation they talk about yeah. potentially um in the mediterranean there was some sort of a climate issue at that it would time have to be something like that but but then i mean they were pretty resourceful people um i mean let's just look at it they <laughs> look at the evidence if they built 60 or more structures in malta megalithic and the work that's been done on skeletons from that period as well is quite interesting because it doesn't really seem to show signs of dental wear, which means that were, they were pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. So if they were so resourceful that they could um, harness their environment and their resources well enough to live very healthy lives um, and build these enormous structures, then what a bit of environmental degradation is going to like scare them off like i don't know it seems strange and and it does seem like kind of a, a sudden abandonment yeah it's interesting and it's you know in a place like malta you can really um you can really see that uh, you know in the mm. record or whatever but uh, we i mean I, on the mainlands we don't know like i i just i also find it weird how they're it makes sense to me when you are like you know mexico cities like giant pyramids have like the mexico cities there still i mean like it, it's it continually it never got abandoned like it, it's continued mm. to within like that kind of thing makes sense to me but but all throughout the world there's so many abandoned cities you know just exactly it's like all over and and even here like that if they were trading so they were able to go across the mediterranean and you know it's not it's not always the easiest um, currents to deal with. So they were on supposedly primitive crafts going to other islands to get all this tools. <laughs> so they were quite good at trading, it seems, but they didn't, um, but they weren't able to like maintain themselves long term here or sustain themselves. I don't know. I, I, I think that's a bit weird. <laughs> like... uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, there's there's so much really uh, interesting mysteries. I ho I hope we get more pieces to the puzzle. I really do. Um, 
yeah but i don't who knows like who knows if we will well the good thing with going through all these monographs and archaeological the most recent archaeological ex excavations and kind of putting them out to a popular audience is that i'm finding things that people didn't really know about so you know a lot of the more popular literature is um it's always very the same so oh, there was all these disarticulated bones in the hypogeum and there was this and there was that mm -hmm. and this was built in five thousand years ago and it's older than stonehenge but um to really go into details and say okay in santa verna in gozo they were depositing little snail figurines in the walls of the temple for no obvious reason um and then all these like really random things that are coming up in the in, and then this whole thing about the island being settled by early neolithic farmers then abandoned then resettled by megalith builders who used some of the same sites like why um so like a lot of these things I've been finding from the most recent academic papers that have been brought out about it. And I think it's, um, it's I, I like putting that out to a popular audience because you, you're finally adding some new stuff to the yes. whole mystery. And then that gets everybody talking. Yeah, and you're, you're adding it in a consumable way because when you read those academic papers, it's, they're a lot to get through for- uh -huh. I mean, I'm not an archeologist and I would just sit there going through, and then I'm like, okay, let me read the uh, the discussion part. Okay, let me read the conclusion. <laughs> like, so, yeah, I um, I subscribe to some arch like some academic archaeology papers, that, and I get an email like once a week with like the top like ten ones that come out, and I I go through them, and it's fascinating stuff. But it's it is like it's, and even for me who's fascinated with this stuff, I'm like, huh. Uh, it's, it's heavy stuff it's it's heavy and the way it's presented is just so i'm like okay what get to the what's the find here like get, get, <laughs> get to the point people yeah um it's kind of hard to consume so I, you're doing an amazing job for people uh -huh. awesome. thanks um, no but that's why i like to do that i, I want to make sure that and, and if someone says to me oh but what do you think about this or i usually um can back it up with some fairly detailed information that i've got from from spending all this time sit like sifting through these papers and really reading the details. And then if there's any kind of terminology that I'm not familiar with, you know, I look it up, I'm, I'm trying my best to, to, to take all of that, pull out the really interesting parts and add it to the mystery that clearly already exists. And then share it with a popular audience that are all well, really also, passionate about this. You're showing us like physically with like videos and pictures that I, I've um, never seen anywhere else. So you know i mean uh -huh. oh i try and get really deep into it you know like i lean as far across the rope as i can <laughs> to get the pictures yeah. but um i did get um appointments to go to a couple of closed sites and they were brilliant i mean it was just fantastic um oh, i really enjoyed that because i had never been to them because they're not open like sometimes they'll do tours to these um to these ones close to the public and the tickets sell so fast like it's really hard to to get to get on the tours so i booked an appointment for them to open it um for me just to go and have a look and this one guy said to me uh, the security guard he said where's everyone else i said what other people he said aren't you a teacher or something aren't you bringing students I said no not a teacher i just really like megaliths <laughs> well now it's like you you're you're gonna blow up i know you're gonna blow up you're gonna be like you know like the brian forrester of oh thanks <laughs> yeah and then so and and then maybe that in itself will get you special access to like private property where you could just go hey like you know i'm not bringing a ton of people but i'm gonna come record it and do stuff and, yeah yeah i mean they're very good here with giving you appointments and things like that but they just fight i guess it's just like but why <laughs> but, <laughs> they're like, i mean general interest uh, groups you know they do go to these places but they go there on an organized tour where someone actually says well this is from this period and this is from this and this is what this does me i have to read all the stuff online first get as much information as i can go through all my books and then go there and i just look and it's just rocks and then i'm trying to figure out which rock is which according to some old plan i mean and they're just staring at me like <laughs> That girl's crazy. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'm like that when I go to museums, like I don't, I don't read the placard. Like, um, uh, I, I, I might read it if, if I'm really interested in the piece or whatever, but I, I, I just like, I'm because I used to work in a museum. Like I know how this thing, where, I mean, like some of the stuff they're writing is just like, oh, and this is the scene of this depicting her feelings of how, and like, 
you don't know, like, or, or even if you do know, I don't want to know your opinion on this. Like, sometimes you need to go with the first principles, like, mm. like, as you're, you're the, you're the, you're the audience, you're the witness, you're like, what are you seeing that's not been seen? And then when you, you know, because the thing is, is like, when someone tells you what to look at, you just look at that thing and you don't, you don't. And there's no context. There's no yeah. context. Cause they take all the things out of the sites. They send them around the world to different museums, right? And, you know, you'll be at, um, I love the British Museum in London because, you know, it's just one heck of a collection yeah. and it's free access and everything. And last time I was there on a work trip, I, I, I just went to the museum for, for a few hours. And I mean, it was awesome, but, and I, I've been there many times, but the thing is, I'm looking at something and it's completely out of its original context, you know, like a statue from Egypt. And it, and it doesn't show you the, so then I'm on my phone Googling the, the, the temple it's saying that it belonged to. And then I'm trying to see, oh, which part of Egypt is that? Oh yeah, that belongs to that dynasty in that period. You know, and I'm just trying to like contextualize it in my brain. Instead of just looking at the object and going, that's pretty. Well, and, and it's, so. and it's so hard too, because like the, everything, you know, you'll have your Rosetta stone and then you have your Parthenon marbles and then you have, you know, you have like that, like, Oh, like, Oh, there's a Sumerian, um, you know, like the big horse or <laughs> yeah. dudes. And you're, you're kind of going like, these are all so different time frames and of different, I mean, and they're all so super important in their own right, but you're just all uh. mixed around in the same thing. And you, you, you have a hard time, like, I, 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 sometimes I feel like there's things that I, I'm not giving any attention and it may be even older than the things that I am giving attention. It's, it's, it, it pulls my uh -huh. heart. I'm always like, ah, oh, wait, what to look at? I don't have, you know, that many hours. So no, exactly. And that's one of the, I mean, I love all different time periods. Like I really do, yeah. but I was like, I have to fix myself on something. And now even, you know, if I go on a holiday, I will use that holiday to, to try to make sure it's somewhere near megalithic structures because then I can incorporate my this work that I'm doing along with the holiday because you know there's only one of you and you can't be just like doing trips all the time also financially it's yeah. it's quite hectic um to manage to do lots of trips per year even after corona so like and then I always think as well like I mean when I go to I love Rome really love Rome I've been many many times to Rome and the last time I was there, no, not last time, maybe the time before that, I, I thought, you know what, I've never been to a Mithraeum. And that's quite a fascinating part of Roman history, the mythology of the Myth Mithras. So there was this Mithraeum that's under the Basilica di San Clemente, and it's only open like at certain times. And under the Basilica, there's like um, an earlier church. Then you go under that, and then you get to this Mithraeum from the Roman times. And I'm just wow you know and everybody just goes to the same museums yeah, obviously the, the forum's amazing and the pantheon's amazing and and all the marble museums are amazing but and then still, you have to go to you know you no have one to knows to the about Vatican this one. and see the sistine and, exactly you've got to see everything but then people this one is so under advertised and i always tell people about it i'm like you have to go there it is so strange uh, i'm mind-blowing <laughs> i've seen all the other main stuff so now i get to go more obscure uh -huh. And it's just behind the Colosseum. And, and the thing is, you've got all the hundreds of people going to the Colosseum. And then you just go around the back, walk down this um, small road. And then you've got about three, three hardcore fans of history waiting to get into this place. But it's great because it's not so busy. That is true. That is good. Yeah. All right, Miss Laura. Well, so tell us, um, this has been really, really fun. So tell us where people can find you. So I'm on Instagram megalith hunter um youtube megalith hunter uh facebook page is megalith hunter so yeah they're my three main um sort of feeds at the moment and then i also have a website megalithhunter.com and um, on that website it's building slowly but what i'm trying to do at the moment is to list all the sites as like fact sheets not blogs not kind of waffly essays just facts these are the years um that the temple was built. This is the GPS location. This is the accessibility. If it's not accessible, I mentioned that it's not accessible. And then I put, what I'm also trying to do is build up like a list of the finds and photographs of the finds that are from each site. So that even if the finds are not on display at the moment, or you know, they're 
they're conserved somewhere or they're in an archive if they're in a book and I'm aware of it and I know that these interesting finds were, were discovered, excavated from it. I list them. So now the main features of this place, the main finds of this place and any interesting facts that you just wouldn't really know about about that place. So I'm trying to build that sort of, let's say a database, a directory with all the modern GPS as well, because I really struggle when I'm going through old papers um, to get the map references. <laughs> And a lot of the place names have changed as well. So, and then whenever I, I, I looked through so many pictures and everything on that, and I was like, this is cool. Yeah, but it's it's a it's slow build, but I'm, I'm getting there. And then I also will, when I go abroad, I will feature, do the, exactly the same with any site I go to. So I'll go through all the papers and books on that site and I'll do my best to give a really like detailed overview, but in a fact, fact sheet format. And then, um, and then over time up add some maps and we can just sort of look at what I'm trying to do when I was saying to you earlier about sort of the map of Malta to say okay um 3600 BCE this is what was here 300 years later remove those these ones were here mm -hmm. and then sort of kind of see the relationship between all the sites and then I'm trying to expand that to obviously many other areas and then you can see if if there is kind of a, a pattern, um, it, I think you, that needs to be done because I, I find a lot of the time everybody's always talking online about patterns, but they're finding patterns between buildings that didn't exist at the same time, which right. does not mean that it's not good re research because there's a very good chance that those buildings, those sites were chosen because they were already important or something. And, and you know, and like, for example, with Stonehenge, it was used um, far far earlier than when the, the stones were built. So, you know, sacred landscapes are sacred landscapes, but I just thought like, this is a really useful tool. And then, you know, we can use it however we want to. I agree with you. Cause I mean, I know, like I looked at a lot of, there's the thing called archeo, 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 archeology, which is like, um, like where people are trying to put constellations in on certain sites, mm. you know, like, like star stuff into it. And then you have a lot of people who talk about ley lines and all that. And I'm like, we don't a hundred percent really know what a ley line is. Like that's, it, mm -hmm. it's almost like I find that's becoming just a blanket word for saying like, oh, that these are in these certain spots. But mm -hmm. um, it, I, 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 I think you're, you really are onto something. And a couple of years ago, actually last year, um, I started trying to build, um, I started trying to get a list of all major um, archaeology spots like in the world and like tried to do like this, um, you put the GPS thing in and there's a, there's a, I can't remember what the name of the, the app was that I was using, but it was basically you could put like Google Sheets thing in and it will map it for you. But it's so cost, it costs a ton. And then I sort of, I, I got way in over my head. I contact, I had some people in India, like putting all these data points in, and then I just ended up doing nothing with it. Um, but uh, so that's why I think, um, I, I think if we all come together with our own data points from every, everything, we might be able, even, even be able to create the same sort of thing as a global map. Mm. And that shows layers of by, you know, 100 years. Exactly. So. I think that would be amazing. 100 years as per the standard um, radiocarbon dating that the archaeologists are, because that's the best that we have to deal with right now. Of course, there's um, controver controversy over different it, dating. As but it just it. with what we've got right now, what we've got. And, and then as a tool for everybody to kind of use and stuff. Like sometimes if I, I mention these things on Instagram or I put my little maps, that people say, oh, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, I didn't know that. And I can sort of use that because I'm, I'm trying to work this thing out. So yeah, and if everybody just kind of like helps each other, I'm sure we, we will kind of, um, with all these collaborations and everybody's knowledge and different backgrounds, we'll, we'll get somewhere. I mean, we probably won't solve the mystery but we will contribute to the discussion well, yeah. in a positive way and that's like I still think we're, like I, I think that there's so many really great researchers have been have been doing some good stuff and it's like you know they come up with theories you didn't even think about and you're like oh yeah that's amazing so yeah I think that if we all keep doing that we'll get somewhere um I mean in some way we don't really want the mystery to be solved because the quest is fantastic isn't it it's such fun <laughs> it's the thrill of the chase in a lot of ways yeah yeah I love it 
Um, and especially like, you know, no matter how much you think you've, you've got to know about something and then you open a book and you're like, no, I didn't know that. And then, you know, it opens up another line, another theory, another question. Um, and even like if we look at all the sites that you, you have around the world, and I know that dating is controversial and whatnot, um, but if you just look at the ones that we know about and we, where we know, I mean, there are just thousands, but you, you, the popular ones that you, you hear about in popular literature all the time, I mean, there are just so many more than that. There are literally yeah. thousands. And I try to explain this to people. There are thousands of stone circles in the UK, thousands. I mean, that have been recorded over hundreds of years. And th something interesting had to have been going on. I mean, it's not I mean, just Stonehenge. I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, there's other things that like really fascinate me too, like um, Terra Preta you know, which is engineered mm, mm, soil. Um, I find that massive acres and acres of yeah. engineered soil. That is like, how, no, and, and the thing is, these are facts. These are science facts. They are. And when you bring it up at a dinner party, people are like, like seriously? What? And like, so, you know, you don't need to go too um, controversial and into like, say the dates are all wrong and talk about, um, lost civilizations and sacred landscapes you don't even need to go into that you can just mention a few facts like this and people are like wow I did not know that and that is actually really interesting yeah. how, how and also I think that we really are off with populations because it's like um and that really hit home for me when I, I went to Guatemala and I was walking through the um I was in the Guatemala pace that I was walking through to call the city to call mm -hmm. and they only have excavated maybe I don't know like five three percent of, of the okay it's it was bigger than New York City like I lived in New York City <laughs> for five years and you're walking around and you can tell like this hill with all these trees on it like you can tell it is a pyramid or it is like a structure it's just been completely grown over or whatever and they've only like I said excavated like a certain amount of them and you can walk to the top of certain pyramids and you'll and then you'll be like looking out on, on top of the, when you're on top of the, all the trees, you start seeing other temples that like have trees and stuff growing on top of them. But you can like, it's like you're on, you're in a city. There's all these skies uh -huh. that are grown on to or whatever. And then you start realizing that, oh, this, this like could have held like some people even say numbers as much as 6 million in just this one city. And there's 60,000 of these little cities like all around there and you're going like wait what and then nobody talks and then you're, at, at, so at one point they were saying that um that there was six million native americans or or of this cult there was about that that was the population at one point down there and you're going mm -hmm. like no there that was the population in this one city like we don't really know how many people like i always had this view growing up that it was like you know and now you know like where where we weren't that many people and then we're tons of people now but that I don't think that's true mm, exactly I don't think so it it doesn't make sense like even just this small island it doesn't make sense that they would need like well if we've found remnants of 60 or so sites there was probably hundreds for what population because we think of the Neolithic as just being a few small domestic villages I mean, it it can't be. Yeah. Um, and 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 like you say, that in Guatemala, we're talking facts here, facts. So there's when people are saying like, oh, ancient history is not that interesting. I'm like, here's just a few small facts, and then tell me that that is not really mysterious and weird, and that you know, and that we think that we know it all. We obviously don't. Yep. I love it. <laughs> I do too. I love it too. That's why I'm always kind of like, 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 okay, like, tell me, talk to me about engineered soil and that the Amazon <laughs> forest could potentially be planted. Let me just set that one down it's for you. It's literally a garden and a massive garden and, and, you know, scientifically backed and people are like, yeah, don't even know. Yeah. I mean, like I have a lot of people go like, they'll just roll my eye. Like they, they, they won't even go like, look into it. And like, like, cause they're, they're just like that that's beyond my paradigm. Like we can't talk about that. And I'm like, okay, right. Well, and also glyphs and hinges and earthworks. That's always been a pretty big thing as well. 
um, and it makes you really wonder because that had to be symbolic. It wasn't very useful otherwise, was it? Yeah. So no. I mean, and there, and like some of like the, the some of these like mounds and some of these things, especially over in the Americas, it pretty much could only be viewed from the air. Like, what's that about? Mm. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of exactly. So I don't know. The mysteries keep on piling. I the mystery on. continues. <laughs> it does. It keeps it continues. Well, we'll have to do this again sometime. And I yeah, absolutely. I really um I love your channel. I recommend everybody go check her out. Like you can don't binge watch something on Netflix or whatever. Like go binge watch yeah. Megalith Hunter. <laughs> you can do it in like one night. You can sit down for right now because eventually you won't be able to because she's gonna have so many amazing videos. Uh -huh. But for right now, she has a few enough ones that are all awesome super consumable and just beautiful so go watch her channel it's amazing and check out her website yeah thanks a lot nikki thanks for having me on all right cool bye